I thought it would be useful if I started with a little background about myself. Uh, obviously, I have a U.S. perspective. So I worked at the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration for 10 years uh, in Washington, then at the Institute of Museum and Library Services for a little over 10 years, and that was, um, this is a funding agency that's somewhat like the DFG, but um, much narrower in scope. It, it's focused specifically on uh, support for libraries, museums, and archives. Uh, and then I had a couple of wonderful years abroad, first in London, where I was a visitor at uh, University College London and the School of Information then uh, here in Berlin at Humboldt University in the uh, School of Library and Information Science. And since 2014, I've been back in Washington uh, until recently, um, but I still am uh, coordinator of the digital curation program and a faculty member in the Museum Studies program at Johns Hopkins University. So I actually lived through uh, and experienced a lot of the historical background that I want to mention today. I trace digital curation in the U.S. back to a task force that was created in uh, 1993 by President Bill Clinton and was headed by Vice President Al Gore called the National Information Infrastructure Task Force. And it developed a uh, proposed strategy to expand knowledge and promote global e-commerce through advanced information technologies. So a legacy of that about 10 years later was a uh, blue ribbon advisory panel on cyber infrastructure um, that was funded by the National Science Foundation uh, and produced a report in 2003, uh, revolutionizing science and engineering through cyber infrastructure. And I believe this was the first time that the term cyber infrastructure appeared in a government report. It predicted that cyber infrastructure will become as fundamental as laboratories and instrumentation, as classroom instruction, as the system of conferences and journals for dissemination of research outcomes. And it also defined cyber infrastructure as research environments that support advanced data acquisition, data storage, data management, data integration, data mining, data visualization, and other computing and information processing services distributed over the internet beyond the scope of a single institution. And uh, this is very much couched in terms that are related to the mission of the National Science Foundation. So um, you don't see a lot of emphasis on uh, people <laughs> here. It's more about data and networks. It in, uh, recommended increasing funding for the National Science Foundation by $1 billion for basic and applied research on cyber infrastructure with investment in data repositories and da digital libraries well-curated data repositories, and better ways to organize and manage large repositories through software infrastructure and the development of standards to ensure interoperability <clears throat> excuse me, through automated techniques to allow data to be self-documenting and discoverable. There was no funding for implementation or for education because the National Science Foundation is a research organization its basic mission, it, basic mission is basic and re applied research. So it naturally went to the more automated aspects of uh, this cyber infrastructure and uh, didn't address how data repositories would be well curated through automated techniques. But meanwhile, in the UK, uh, we see the first use of the term digital curation, which I believe was in a task force that was convened by uh, what was then known as the Joint Information Systems Committee, or JISC, to discuss the feasibility and potential benefits of a strategic approach to the preservation and reuse of primary research data, focused on the expertise required to perform essential tasks. 
And so um, this report came out in 2002, and um, JISC, in contrast to the National Science Foundation, had no real um, uh, mandate for research. They were more focused on implementation. So that led to the establishment of the Digital Curation Center in 2003, which did um, host a number of uh, workshops and training programs, but had no uh, funding for formal graduate education. <clears throat> but back in the US, um, this was a time that I worked for the Institute of Museum and Library Services, <clears throat> and we got a windfall in our budget from the then First Lady, Laura Bush, who you may know was a former librarian herself, and she expressed interest in helping libraries, which led to the creation of a new program funded by Congress in 2003 uh, that is still known as the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program, although today with um, less money than we had at one time. We were quite well funded in that program at that time. And we had um, a broad, broad flexibility as to how we use the money, just that it would be something about professional education for uh, librarians. So we put out a call for um, proposals for development of a curriculum in digital curation programs in schools of library and information science, which led to the creation of a number of graduate certificate programs and tracks within the master's degree program in library and information science. However, because this program was for libraries, uh, we had no funding to support um, education of museum professionals through this money and their budget was much smaller. So whoosh up to the current <laughs> today. Um, we're beginning to see, I think, policy come into practice for museums. Um, I have been with the um, uh, Museum Studies Program at Johns Hopkins and uh, since 2014, a coordinator of a new graduate certificate program in digital curation. So it's now two years old. Uh, it launched in 2014 with a dual option, meaning that students could uh, simultaneously uh, do the museum studies, uh, master's degree, and the graduate certificate in digital curation. It has six courses, five core, one elective. I'll talk about just a bit. Uh, it is mostly online with one required internship. And we currently have about 60 students in the program, most of which are in the dual master's and certificate program. And because there still is not really a consensus on the definition of digital curation, we felt that we had to put one forward and also that we had flexibility to define it um, according to our focus. So we have taken, uh, I think one of the iterations of the definition from the Digital Curation Center and tweaked it just a bit. So we define digital curation as the planning and management of digital assets over their full lifetime from conceptualization through active use and presentation, this was the portion that we added to really get at the importance of presentation of digital assets in the museum world, to long-term preservation in a repository for future reuse. Um, so I mentioned there are six courses. Three of them are basic courses that are taken by all students uh, in the program regardless of their disciplinary focus. So they take a course on digital pr preservation, which um, prepares them to uh, work on a team to develop a digital curation plan for an institution. They take a course, Foundations of Digital Curation, that really stresses um, standards and principles for interoperability, uh, including uh, metadata schemas, control vocabularies, and participation in aggregations of various types for digital content. A course in managing digital information in museums that gives uh, a little bit more hands-on experience, working with some open source software tools. And then three customized courses that students can tailor to their own 
career goals and disciplinary focus, depending on what type of museum they want to work in um, or, and uh, what type of job they want to do there. Um, and that includes an internship that uh, is a full semester course, but requires 120 hours being spent on site uh, at this sponsoring institution. Uh, one elective or could be a second internship. And finally, a research paper that um, would build on the internship and also contribute to the literature in the field, which is still uh, somewhat restricted, especially uh, for museums. So we've had students doing internships um, all over the US. We've had one actually in London at the Imperial War Museum, uh, others at the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian Institution, a number of university uh, art galleries, and historical societies. So I won't say too much about um, those, but just to say that, uh, as I mentioned, we would like the internship experience to lead to the development of a research proposal that, again, is another um, full semester course. And that course is designed to enable students to demonstrate critical thinking skills, to investigate a problem in digital curation, uh, to contribute to the emerging research literature, and finally, to create an environment to sustain ongoing research throughout the digital curation community in practice as well as education. Finally, we um, convened a digital curation summit in October, last October that was funded by the Crest Foundation to explore the potential for collaboration between art museums and graduate education programs. And um, this was kind of an eye-opening experience because we had a number of uh, participants from museums, uh, including uh, some directors of art museums and people working in various parts of um, areas of museum practice. And the first question that came up is, um, well, how do you define digital curation? And you know, for every person there, I think there was a different perspective. There was only one person who um, worked at a museum who had actually had the term digital curation in his job title, but he had really been hired to do social media. So a lot of the concepts that we were talking about, about uh, sustainability and uh, repositories and all that was, uh, as he said, he was having an existential moment, so <laughs> it was um, kind of interesting. Um, also, I wanted to mention that um, we had a vendor, the vendor who actually created this gallery wall at the uh, Cleveland Museum of Art, which is a uh, wall when patrons come in the door, they can click on one of these images and bring up some uh, meta descriptive metadata about the work and see what's currently on display in the museum. And um, this vendor had done some you know, amazingly innovative projects um, in different museums. But when the first question came up about sustainability, it was clear that his definition was um, quite different because he thought of sustainability as how long people who um, use these innovative um, installations remembered what they had learned. So there was really a, a disconnect there. And so that was one of the first conclusions that we came to in a consensus mode was that uh, museums must take responsibility for preservation of their own innovative um, installations, even if they hire an outside vendor to construct it. <clears throat> so um, some of the recommendations and highlights that came out of this study, um, the summit report, was uh, to create an advocacy strategy within the art museum community, to highlight stories of innovative and effective practices, perhaps through uh, awards at professional associations, to promote the value of internships for the sponsor and for the profession, 
uh, as well as for the student, and to identify potential projects for interns and for student researchers, and to involve professional associations in all areas with the overall goal of creating communities of practice and research that would be integrated with the uh, information infrastructure. So um, in conclusion, I would say we now have an information infrastructure that was envisioned back in 1993 uh, that must be sustained and enhanced and it includes a lot more than just um, computer networks and information processing. We have a lot of tools and services and resources, uh, as well as uh, software components that all contribute to this information infrastructure, as well as, I would say, the data itself. If it can be reused, it's part of the information infrastructure now. And uh, I would also note that policies are driven by national priorities, that national priorities are variable, some often unpredictable, and that academic priorities respond to national priorities. And if you really want to know um, what's driving everything, just follow the money, because that's generally the bottom line. It, it's going to drive what uh, happens.